Welcome to the Hush Blackwell mini webinar series. Now that January is over, we're going to take a look back at 2019 at some of the trends and talk about what we can expect to see in 2020 and beyond. Hi, I'm Erica Ash and I'm an attorney at Hush Blackwell and I specialize in healthcare law. Today I'm going to be talking to two of my colleagues, Renee Zerbonia and Wakaba Tessier. Renee and Wakaba have extensive experience working with clients in the healthcare industry and with pharmacies in particular. They both have helped a number of clients acquire and sell pharmacies, as well as helping to solve the day-to-day -day regulatory issues that come up. Thank you both so much for being here. I'm really excited to talk to you about the trends that you've seen in healthcare. Can you give us a preview of what you saw this year in healthcare, Wakaba? Sure, Erica, I'd be happy to. Hi, everyone. I'm Wakaba Tessier, and I'm a partner here in Kansas City. Um, before we dive into what we thought were the top trends of 2019, wanted to give just a general overview of our mini webinar today. We're going to be talking about prescription drug prices, patient convenience, industry integration, and then scrutiny of opioids. Thanks, Wakaba. I know drug pricing was a huge deal in 2019. Renee, could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, happy to, Erica. Um, like you said, we saw a lot of attention being paid to prescription drug pricing and the costs Americans are facing and paying for their prescription drugs. Um, according to the Kaiser Family Foundation, in fact, we see that over 80% of Americans think that Congress should be working to lower prescription drug costs for as many Americans as possible. That's a huge number. Is the Senate doing anything right now to fix these issues? Yeah, so we've seen a couple of different bills introduced in Congress at the federal level. In the Senate, we see the Drug Pricing Reduction Act. Um, this act has it aims to considerably reduce the Medicare Part D beneficiary out-of-pocket costs, um, and it also tries to establish a cap on that out-of-pocket spending that would begin in 2022. So that's what we're seeing at the, at the Senate level, and that appears to be a somewhat bipartisan bill. In the House, we have H.R. 3, or the Lower Drug Costs Now Act, um, this one's a little bit different. Um, under this bill, Medicare would have uh, the power to help negotiate drug prices. You'd see increased focus on limiting out-of-pocket costs at a $2,000 annual cap. And you'd also see some alignment of drug prices in the United States with the smaller amounts that other countries are paying. So among, among various other things in HR3. Um, so, so there are different bills that have been introduced in Congress, and it'll be interesting to see in 2020 which of those gets traction. Um, you know, we expect to see the Senate bill probably see a little bit more movement than, than the House bill at this time. Are the states doing anything in regards to drug spending? Right, and I, and I can take that. This is Wakaba. Um, so again, according to Kaiser, um, in 2019, 33 states enacted 51 laws to address drug pricing and accessibility of drugs. And those um, laws were about authorizing the importation of drug, establishing oversight boards, and then screening for excessive price increases. Um, specifically, there are many states that have now enacted um, anti-gag rules for pharmacists, and those are rules um, that stop pharmacists from discussing with customers whether a drug's uh, cash price would be lower than the out-of-pocket cost under insurance. So it prohibits that discussion. And so they said, well, no, pharmacists should be able to communicate that with their customers. Um, some states, um, in 2019, it was four states, Colorado, Florida, Maine, and Vermont. Um, they allowed the importation of cheaper drugs into the country um, because, you know, the, the drug prices were getting too prohibitive. Um, let's see. And then the other thing was when I talk about the oversight board, a lot of them called the drug affordability boards. As far as I know, Maryland and Maine has these. Um, I think New Jersey and Massachusetts were thinking about adopting similar legislation this year. So there's a lot going on on the state level too. So I think it's definitely a key area that we'll want to keep an eye out on in 2020. Yeah. And 
just to build on that and circle back to the federal side really quickly, we have seen some movement from CMS and some proposed rules that aim to further, you know, reduce a Medicare advantage as well as Part D prescription prescription drug costs for patients. Um, I believe there was a rule, a proposed rule recently introduced earlier this month that aimed to do just that. So another thing to keep in mind when looking at, you know, the steps that the state and federal government are taking to try to address prescription drug prices. I think, too, from a compliance perspective, like flipping it on the pharma side, there's, and, and the PBM side, I think there's you know, there's 50 states, 50 laws, right? And and the fact that they're passing all of these laws means that the compliance issues are going to be pretty pretty big and hard to keep track of for these uh, pharma and PBM uh, companies. So, like for example, in Oregon, um, they require a drug manufacturer to notify the state at least 60 days in advance of any planned increase of 10% or more in the pricing of brand name drugs and 25% or greater increase in generic drugs. So I think there's a lot to keep track of, both on the pharmacy side and the sort of the more pharmaceutical PBM side. So this is really sort of a a complicated and an exciting area. Yeah, and and just to, I guess, build on that even more, um, something else that we've seen is, you know, not not necessarily at the state or federal level, but in the private sector um, with the formation of a coalition of different hospitals joining together to form, you know, nonprofit drug manufacturers. I'm specifically, I'm referring to Civica RX here, but you see these different um, players in the market, you know, joining together and taking steps to address um, increased drug costs and, and drug shortages and uh, making sure that they are in a position to address those drug shortages and make sure that their patients have the medication that they need. Um, and, and in doing so, you know, doing so in an affordable uh, manner. So it's just another thing that we, we've we seen, and it will probably be something that continues in 2020. Um, another note about Civic Rx, I believe that they've recently formed a spinoff as well, um, where they've created a subsidiary to work with private insurance companies, um, specifically Blue Cross Blue Shield. So it'll be interesting to see the steps that people take in 2020 and beyond in how to address these drug prices and and to keep costs under control. So nowadays it feels like everyone wants everything to be more convenient, at least I know I do. So how are we seeing that affect healthcare and healthcare delivery? Right, so in 2019, we saw some new players entering the marketplace. Well, actually, let me go back to to 2018 because as some of you may know, Amazon bought PillPack for $753 million. And for those of you that don't know PillPack, PillPack actually puts all the medications that you take into one little bag so that when you get it in the mail, you have it's divided up into doses and when you should take them. So it makes it very convenient for the patient. There is another company, I believe, Renee, based out of New York, right? That's right. Capsule. Yeah, that's right. Capsule. And this is one where um, you, the, the physician writes the prescription for the medication and then submits it to Capsule. And then the patient gets a text from Capsule to say, hey, when do you want your delivery of these prescri- prescription drugs delivered to you? So it makes it, you, you kind of avoid that stop where you have to go to CVS or, or Walgreens to fill the script and then maybe wait because then it just gets delivered right to your door. So I think convenience is a huge thing. Um, We also are seeing an increased scope of practice for pharmacists and and I'm going to tie this to convenience, and, and it's because, especially in rural areas, a lot of the times pharmacists are the people that see patients face to face. It's sometimes harder to see um, your doctor or get into your doctor, particularly if you have to travel a long time. And so we see a trend towards pharmacists increase scope of practice for pharmacists. And in most states, I think Renee, when we were talking earlier, you you had guess that maybe most states these days define a pharmacist as a healthcare provider. So pharmacists are starting to get more recognized um, as independent healthcare providers. Um, And I get to, to, 
piggyback on that, telemedicine, telepharmacy, that's always going to be increasing in 2020. So we'll definitely see more of that. There's um, Renee, I think, wants to talk a little bit or knows a lot about sort of the startup environment um, with respect to a patient convenience. So Renee, do you want to talk a little bit about that and maybe that interesting deal that you just completed? Sure. So uh First, to touch on the startup industry, you know, it is interesting. Over the past few years, we have seen a number of these different, you know, emerging startup companies such as Capsule, Blink Health, GoodRx, um, all of them kind of trying to break into the pharmacy space and disrupt the market, so to speak. Um, it, it, so it'll be really interesting to see how a lot of those different companies continue to play out and the impact that they're going to have on the market. Um, it's also something to think about when looking at how those startups are, you know, changing the landscape is also the effect that all of this is going to have on your independent and community pharmacies um, with a lot of the industry consolidation and, you know, shift towards um, immediate free fast delivery and, and, and all of that. You see a lot of, you actually see a lot of closures for your retail, traditional retail pharmacies. And so, you know, something to look for in 2020 is to see you know, how these particular pharmacies are going to adapt and you know, we may see more consolidation on that front as well. Um, you know, to touch on the role of pharmacists and pharmacies, you know, I was recently working on a deal that involved a, a, a pharmacy that was aimed for patients at a, with a specific disease state. And so, you know, beyond just dispensing medication, you saw them, you know, engaging with patient counseling. There was testing. They had, you know, a much broader scope of service than you would traditionally expect to see, you know, in your pharmacy, or at least you may, maybe what you expected to see a few years ago. Um, you know, as we see the role of pharmacists continuing to expand, it's really becoming like a drugs and model where you expect, okay, you're receiving your medication and you may be going in for counseling or medication adherence um, education or testing or, or something else, you know, beyond that initial just dispensing of your drugs. So we expect to see a greater focus on that and not just in 2020, but in the future as well. So Renee, you were talking about some of the consolidation that we've seen in the healthcare industry. Can you talk about how this integration has played out in 2019 and what it could mean in 2020 and beyond? Sure, Erica. So we have seen a lot of industry integration, not just in the pharmacy space, but in the healthcare space generally over the past few years. Um, specifically, you know, in pharmacy, I think since 2018 and 2019, we've seen a lot of vertical integration between different pharmacies and healthcare systems, PBMs, uh, different players in the industry. So we're talking about the CVS Aetna deal, you know, the massive merger that closed in 2018. Uh, we've got the Cigna Express Scripts deal. And, and Walgreens as well, who has affiliated themselves with, you know, a number of, of different both pharmacies and, and other players in the market. So, um, you know, I believe they've entered into some arrangements with Fred's, Rite Aid. They purchased a number of Rite Aid pharmacies, and they may, I believe they have an arrangement with Kroger as well. So we've seen a lot of consolidation as people look to, you know, put themselves in a position to realize efficiencies by joining with other different providers. Um, and it's both in that vertical integration where you see people, you know, along all aspects, all aspects of the industry kind of aligning to streamline delivery, um, as well as horizontal integration where people are, you know, consolidating and trying to cut costs and provide more comprehensive care. So that's what we've seen over the past few years. I think moving forward into 2020, we're going to see a little bit more of this, see it continue in the future as some of these different pharmacies and, and providers in the industry are looking to realize greater benefits from consolidation, whether it's you know greater ability to manage patient care or to realize cost efficiencies or, you know, benefits that may come from information sharing, things like that. Um, but there are some 
potential risks associated with consolidation. So, Wakaba, could you tell us about a few of those? Yeah, sure. So, when you consolidate any two entities, you really need to sort of look at, and again, we're talking about the healthcare space. So, you know, it's two entities in a highly regulated industry coming together. And so you need to make sure that both entities are compliant um, before integration and after integration, make sure that the, the sort of the compliance trend conditions, c compliance uh, trends continue with the integrated entity. And certainly you can realize efficiencies, right? Because you might have the same um, training module, you'll probably, you might have the, you know, just one compliance officer, um, you'll have, you know, one consolidated bigger workforce um, undergoing and following the same, undergoing training and following the same policies and procedures. But I think with more workforce, there's definitely a potential for more mistakes, um, probably uh, greater compliance concerns related to, for example, HIPAA, which, you know, a lot of HIPAA enforcement arises out of um, human error. And so those are things to consider. I guess, relatedly on, on the whole integration uh, growth, I think we would be remiss to not talk about private equity. Um, Erica, you, maybe you can talk a little bit about this, but we did a webinar, what, like last, late last year about kind of the private equity movement and we actually did a webinar about a particular case. Yeah, so that was RLH Partners um, and it was, the case was obviously brought by the United States Department of Justice and so essentially that was the first case where they went after the private equity owners. So while everyone kind of notices this private equity roll up, clearly the Department of Justice also is noticing it and is uh, seeing that maybe that's a place to look to some recovery. Right, and, and obviously that case, because the DOJ took notice, there were some issues, very major issues, um, with the way that the private equity owners were directing business. There were a lot of fraud, waste, and abuse issues, and if you're inter interested, we'd be happy to send you our short little webinar on that as well. But the whole private equity space is definitely um, growing. Um, they are buying up healthcare companies, and with that, in terms of tying it with compliance, I think private equity people have to be wary of the compliance issues related to healthcare. So I don't think this is gonna come as a surprise to any of our viewers, but there's gonna be a sustained focus on opioids. I recently watched a Netflix documentary called The Pharmacist, and they were talking about the opioid crisis in Louisiana um, related to Oxycontin and Purdue Pharma. And it was really timely because this is really what we heard about in 2019. And we expect it to go, we don't expect this topic to die, right, Renee? Right, in 2019, we saw just, you know, far too many to even count <laughs> settlements between drug manufacturers and, you know, state counties, state attorney generals, um, and the DOJ with respect to opioid litigation. Um, you know, there were a number, just a large number of different settlements. And it's interesting because we expect to see, you know, some of the settlements to con continue through 2019. But, you know, just in the past day or so, we did see that nearly 20 or more than 20 state attorney generals actually rejected an $18 billion settlement offer that was made from three major drug wholesalers that was trying to reach an end to their litigation um, and about their role in this opioid crisis. So, you know, it, it was something that was certainly on everyone's mind in 2019 as far as the litigation and settlements go. Um, it sounds like it's going to be continuing for throughout 2020, so it'll be interesting to see how all that plays out. Definitely, Renee, and obviously with that increase, with that rejection comes an increased risk of liability because they're not actually done with these lawsuits. So, I mean, in the future, you could see more people getting dragged in as it progresses. And by the way, Purdue Pharma um, declared bankruptcy as a result of the litigation is what I saw on the pharmacist. <laughs> That makes sense. And there's also changes not only coming just because of litigation, 
but the United States government passed the Support Act, and I believe that was passed in 2018. And so part of the Support Act, um, those changes are coming in 2021. So they're going to require prior authorizations for all of the Medicare Part D medications. And so this is going to be a pretty big change and might require pharmacies to have more efficient workflow processes in place and just make sure that, you know, all of their data security is in place and all of that. And then in 2022, opioid scripts will require both a credentials check and a biometrics check. So how this was explained to me is it's like a two-part check. So first, they're going to have to make sure the certain prescriber whose name is on the script is actually prescribing it. And then there's going to need to be some biometric marker to ensure their identity. So like a fingerprint, what you used to do with your phone, or a face scan. So um, they're thinking they can make it into some sort of application. And I think some of the bigger pharmacies are going to roll that out sooner than 2022 to ensure that the workflow is ready to go. I guess that raises an interesting question, and this is beyond um, the topic of this webinar, so stay tuned for the next one. But data privacy right, becomes a really important issue when we're talking about collecting people's biometric data. There were some privacy laws passed in Illinois related to biometric um, data, and so it'll in be interesting to see how states react to that as well. And we can get, again, we can dive more into the security and privacy issues related to, you know, not only patient data, but, but employee data. But again, that, that is neither here nor there today. So we've touched on a lot of the top trends from prescription drug prices to increased focus on patient convenience, industry integration, and the scrutiny that continues to be on opioids. And I just wanted to say thank you both so much for sharing your expertise with us. I really enjoyed talking to you. Thanks, Erica. We enjoyed talking with you as well, and we're excited to see what 2020 has in store. Um, for everyone listening out there, uh, we hope you found this webinar interesting and maybe even a little informative, and we thank you all for listening. Speaking of 2020, there's another trend that we forgot to mention. What's that? So this is our third installment of these mini webinars, and we would like to make this a series. And so please keep your eyes and ears out for more of these in 2020. Great. Well, I look forward to hearing them.